This evening we consider the theme, the rule of the dragon slayer. The rule of the dragon slayer. Now, happy Chinese New Year to all here who celebrate it. And it's during this time of the year that people wish one another blessings and prosperity. You know, they believe that their words in wishing people good things can bring good things to pass. And that's why people visit during this time of the year. They can bring blessings to their friends' houses, to their relatives' houses. That's why they reciprocate. They go house to house bringing these blessings. Now, if lucky words, if speaking lucky wishes could bring fortune and prosperity, uh, then our whole year would be problem-free, correct? <laughs> if, if that's all it takes. But we also know that speaking alone brings no good fortune. We know that wishing blessings on people, all of these wishes, they're not magic spells. And this is especially true for us who are Christians. We don't believe that speaking these words would bring these wishes to pass. You know, it's not that we do not wish people well. It's not that we do not hope for blessings upon them, but good words themselves have no power. Only the living and true God has power. And that is why we believe in prayer. We pray to an almighty God. Only he can bring deliverance, blessing, prosperity to pass. Now, during Chinese New Year, people also hope for fortune that's brought about by their star or by their zodiac sign. You know, many, many people today, they're looking forward to this year. Why? It's governed by the dragon. Lots of people hope to have kids, hope to have dragon babies, and they believe that because it is, in their mind, governed by the dragon. They think it'll be a good year for those born in the year of the dragon. All right, their star sign, you could say, in the Ang Mo way, it is ascending, right? But interestingly, if you read and understand the thoughts that people have today, this year is a wood dragon year. So people are anticipating, oh, you know, there will be problems unless certain things are done, you know, unless certain things are avoided. And there will be people who will live in fear. You know, will they do the right things to usher in dragon fortune? Or may they do the wrong things to experience dragon fire? Now, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, as believers in the living and true God, we don't believe in this. We, we have a God that is more powerful than any dragon. In fact, you know, interestingly, our passage, which we read, says he can wound, he can slay the dragon. And so we as believers, we know that blessing and salvation do not come from the year, do not come from the rule of the dragon, or simply by wishing good things. Blessing and prosperity and salvation, they can only come by praying to an almighty God that his rule would increase in our lives. And this is what we see in our passage. The people, they knew this. They prayed this. And when they knew who God was, that is when they prayed to him. So we will examine this passage in two points. Firstly, the prayer for God's salvation, for God's saving rule. Secondly, the promise of God's saving rule. So firstly, the prayer for God's saving rule. And in our church, in our evening service, we've been looking at the Lord's Prayer. We have seen why we ought to pray. We pray because God is a loving Heavenly Father. He's merciful to hear. He is powerful to answer all of our prayers. And that's why we depend on Him. 
That's why we pray persistently to him because he alone answers prayer. And we as God's people do not only pray for earthly things, we pray for spiritual things because spiritual things are the things that ultimately matter. You know, we're not saying that wealth and health, opportunity and success are bad things. In fact, they're not bad things, but eternal life, forgiveness, these things are far more important. And this were the things that these people prayed for. You know, we read in verse 9, awake, awake. Put on strength, O arm of God. Awake as in the ancient days, in the generations of old. Art thou not it that hath cut Rahab and wounded the dragon? So here they prayed. And we see with the words that they used, they were praying persistently. They were asking God three times to awake. Twice at the start, awake, awake. Then in the middle of verse 9, awake as in the ancient days. Now, why did they ask God to awake? Why did they say it three times? Why the persistence? <laughs> is it perhaps God cannot hear? Is it maybe because he is weak? And the answer, of course, is no. Remember, God does not sleep. You know, there are people who go to the Shinto shrines in Japan, and they would go in there, they would clap their hands twice or three times or four times to wake up the kami, right? Because their gods are known to sleep. But we're told in Psalm 121 verse 4, God neither slumbers nor sleeps. You know, he's not drowsy, he's not nodding off to sleep, neither is he in a deep sleep and a long sleep. Rather, the Bible tells us that our God is alert. And furthermore, we all know that God has no body that requires sleep. So the question that is still before us is why did they ask him three times to wake up? The short answer is this, it's because God is merciful. Now, we read verses 1 to 8. In verses 1 to 8, God told his people to listen. How many times? Three times. You see, God's people, they were about to go through an intense period of difficulty. In those days, there was a threat of warfare. The Babylonians, they were about to come. They were about to attack and they would enslave the people of God. You see, Babylon was a major superpower in those days. Now, we have to come to terms to this, with this, right? We must know that God allows difficult things to happen to his people. The, the presence of problems in our lives doesn't mean that God is bad. A good God does allow people to encounter trials. You know, we always also say good parents do not mollycoddle their children. Parents understand that children need to go through hardship. And so too, God allows his own children to go through difficulties. And even though we as God's children, we may not understand it at times, yet we know that God has his sovereign purpose. So, here, God was about to allow his people to go through difficulty, but in the midst of this, God told them, listen up, I will save you. Listen up, he promised them mercy. And we see here that the word hear or listen is used three times. Verse one, hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness. Verse 4, hearken unto me, my people, and give ear to me. Verse 7, hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness. So three times, hear ye, hear ye, hear ye, listen, listen, listen. Why? Because God was telling them, even though you go through these difficulties, one day my wonderful promises will come to pass. Despite your difficulties, I will deliver you. Now, what kind of deliverance did he promise? We've seen this as we read through verses 1 to 8. In verses 2 and 3, he promised them blessing, prosperity, and joy. 
in verses 4 and 5, he promised them justice and light. He, even their enemies, they will one day be converted, either that or they'll be judged. And then verses 6 to 8, he promised them a deliverance and a salvation that would be eternal. People, listen up three times. I will deliver you and bless you with all kinds of prosperity and salvation forever and ever and ever. This is why God's people, they prayed. Three times they told God, awake, 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 because they knew his promises that he would save them. Because he invited them to hear him, why shouldn't they pray to God? And these were people who had experienced God's deliverance in the past. They experienced his powerful protection. Now, many times in the Bible, you have this phrase, not just here, people had asked God to awake, right? When King David was dethroned, when he was slandered, you know, he said in Psalm 7 to God, God, will you please stand up in your anger and judge my enemies? In Psalm 35, David also asked God to awake to bring justice. So God's people in their times of trouble have always turned to God because God's people know his power. They acknowledge that he is a king, that he is a God that brings salvation and justice. Now, we also see this in our passage. Verse 9, notice the words, awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. So here, God's people were praying to God Put on strength. Clothe your arm with power. Now, what were they asking here? This can be taken, you know, uh, two ways, and both of them have the same idea. When you wake up and you've got a job to do, what do you do? You put on your clothes. So, for example, if you're a school uh, student, what do you do in the morning when you get up? What do you put on? You put on your uniform to go to school because that's your job, to be a student. Firefighters, all right, when the bell and the alarm rings, what do they do when they wake up? They get into their uniform to do their job, to prepare to fight fire, all right? That's their job. And likewise, soldiers, right, when they have the reveille in the morning, uh, what do they do? They immediately put on their full battle order in order to go to war because that's their job, to fight. So here, when the people were asking God, awake and clothe your arm, they were asking God to do his job, to rule, to conquer, to be a king. So the people were praying to God to arm himself, as if to put on armor, to have a sword in order to conquer his enemies, in order to save them because he is a king. You see, these people would go through years of difficulties, but the year of the king would finally come. The year of the dragon slayer would come upon them and they would experience salvation. And God's people here in verses 9 and 10 they called upon God to deliver them because they had experienced his power in the past. They say, awake as in the ancient days, in the generations of old. You know, aren't you the one who cut down Rahab? Aren't you the one who wounded the dragon? Aren't you the one who dried up, you know, the deep waters of the sea so that your ransomed people can walk through them as on dry ground? So in the past, the people of God were recounting something that had happened. There was another time when God's people were going through great difficulty, and God arose and he delivered them. Now, this was 650 years before Isaiah was written. God had rescued his people 
when they were slaves in Egypt. Now, many of us, Christian or not Christian, we would be familiar with that story, all right? And that was the greatest salvation up to that point. Now, what did God do at that point in time? His people, they were slaves in Egypt. Pharaoh was ill-treating them. They were going through many difficulties, and they cried out to God. And as a result, God answered. He, according to the verse, cut Rahab. He wounded the dragon. <laughs> he was the dragon slayer, all right? Now, the first word used here is Rahab, which in Hebrew simply means boaster. This was just another name for Egypt. Egypt at that point in time uh, was the most powerful nation on earth. She was very proud of her power. She was a superpower, but God struck her down this great superpower. So if God struck Egypt down 650 years before that, then God, he could strike down the oppressors of the people presently and in the future, right? He could strike down, he, could, he, he struck down Egypt in the past, he could strike down Babylon now. You know, these two world powers were nothing compared to God. Now, how did God cut Rahab? How did he cut down Egypt? Well, he destroyed Pharaoh. Verse 10 speaks of how he dried up the Red Sea, the waters of the deep. You know, we're all familiar with that story. And maybe if you're not familiar with the story in the Bible itself, maybe you've watched like Prince of Egypt or something, where God spread and parted the waters of the Red Sea so that Israel could pass over. And once they passed over and the Egyptian armies together with Pharaoh who were chasing them, God let the waters come back on and drown Pharaoh and his men. So no matter how much Egypt was able to boast of her power, no matter how powerful she was, God was more powerful. How about the dragon? We see this in our verse. God wounded him. Now, who is the dragon here? Pharaoh. He was the dragon. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Ezekiel 29, verse 3. Ezekiel 29, verse 3. The Bible says, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lieth in the midst of his rivers, which hath said, My river is mine own, and I have made it for myself. So this verse speaks about how Pharaoh boasted about himself. You know, Pharaoh in those days was thought to be the life giver in Egypt. You know, from him would come all blessings. Uh, he was, in fact, uh, said to be the incarnation of the sun god Ra. And together with the Nile River, he was thought to bless all of Egypt. But as we know, and we know the story, God turned the waters of the Nile into blood. He made the waters undrinkable. He killed all the fish, and he made the Nile powerless. Pharaoh, no matter how much he said, the river is mine, he could not even do anything to rectify this plague. Uh, Pharaoh also could not do anything as the supposed incarnation of the sun god Ra when God brought the plague of darkness. Even, you know, during 12 noon, the skies were completely dark. So the sun of the sun god could do nothing. And so this was to be a picture to the people of God that was very stark. The dragon who was supposed to bring blessing to the people was powerless because God is the dragon slayer. And he did all of that to deliver his people who were oppressed by Pharaoh. That was the power of God over Egypt. And so, because God's people see the power of God to save, that is why we pray. So, dearly beloved, our series here 
as we come to the Heidelberg is on prayer. Why do we pray? Because God is a saving king. He can destroy all things. He can save us from all trouble. So when we pray, thy kingdom come, we're asking God that in the midst of our trials, that he would preserve us, that he would increase us, that he would destroy the works of the devil and every power that raises itself against him. Because God has promised deliverance. He has promised complete rule. You know, dearly beloved, as we come today to hear this word, our hope is not in good words. Our hope is not in good fortune for this year. Our hope is not in health, wealth, opportunity, and success. You know, we as believers, we do not live for the moment. We, on the other hand, live for an eternity. Our hope and blessing is to be forgiven of our sins, to be delivered from Satan, to be received by God. So for all the well wishes that you are giving today and that you hope to hear for yourself, the most important thing, far greater than any good words, are the good words of the gospel, that there is salvation and eternal life in Christ Jesus, who forgives all who call upon him for the forgiveness of their sins. Now that's why, secondly, We want to see the promise of God's saving rule, the promise of God's ultimate and eternal saving rule. Again, the deliverance that we hope for, the blessing that we hope for is not just for a year, is not just for a season, but it is an eternal salvation. You know, we're not interested in a prosperous new year. As believers, we are more interested in a prosperous eternity. So here we see from verse 11 onwards, this salvation, this prosperity described. Let me read verse 11. Therefore, the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. Now this promise of God here for those who call upon him will be an everlasting joy. So it's nothing temporary here. It is for, it is an eternal salvation because in verse six, it says, my salvation shall be forever. It wasn't as much as the people were going through difficulty, if they were to cry out to God, if they really understood who God was, they were not simply asking God for salvation from their earthly enemies. Yes, as I said, Babylon would come. It's a superpower. It would attack. But God's people who truly understand who God is, who truly understand his promise of eternal life and salvation, they know that if they cry to him, he would do much more than just saving them from human enemies. He would save them and give them a permanent solution to sin. As a ruler, with a strengthened arm, with armor, with a sword, he would redeem his people from sin. Now, how do we know that this promise of blessing here is not temporary? A lot of us are thinking, well, with all the inflation, maybe this year will be better. Dragon year, put my money in this stock. Put my money in this bond. (laughs) It'll definitely grow. We're too short-sighted. This promise here was one of eternal blessing. It was not earthly blessing. And how we know that is we see this in the words everlasting joy. And this everlasting joy will bring gladness. Sorrow and mourning, they will flee away. 
You know, dearly beloved, we all, most of us here who celebrate Chinese New Year, we know the tedium every year. Why do you need to clean your houses every year? Why? Sweep, 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 clean, 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 dust, dust, wipe. Why? Because we know after we do it once, what happens? It accumulates again. Some of you, you visit your relatives. Is it always happy, happy, joy, joy to see them all? No, it's not. Some of you have difficulties with some of your relatives. It's not a pleasant time of the year. Also, you have offended people. They have offended you. But here, we see sorrow and mourning will flee away. It's everlasting joy. So what God is promising here to those who call upon him is not something temporary. It is something permanent. It is a lasting deliverance. It is not a temporary or a physical prosperity. You know, in the first deliverance that we were looking at, when God's people were rescued from the rule of Pharaoh, their redemption was joyful. But the problem was this, because they were not looking to God for spiritual deliverance, their redemption, their physical freedom from slavery did not last. Yes, they were no longer slaves of the Egyptians, but they were still slaves to sin. That's why when they crossed the wilderness for those 40 years, they grumbled, they complained. Yes, even though God had delivered them, showed them his strong arm in rescuing them, they were not interested in spiritual things. They did not cry out to God for spiritual things. And because they did not cry out to God for spiritual things, they did not see his rule over them. They did not submit to him. So even though God had delivered them, they were not thankful to him. That's why they murmured and complained for 40 years. The majority of them died in the wilderness. And even though God fed them daily, he gave them water to drink daily. Their clothes never wore thin. They didn't have to do the yearly thing of buying new clothes. Right? Yet they did not submit to God's rule because the people back then were only interested in an earthly salvation. They were only interested in a happy life, material blessing. They didn't want to give their allegiance to God. And that's the problem with many people today. They want an earthly blessing. They want prosperity now, but they do not want a spiritual salvation that God can give. But here, God promised. God promised those who would call upon him to rule over them, to save them. He promised those that would submit to his rule that he would give them an everlasting redemption. Everlasting joy shall be upon, his, upon their head. Even verse 12, it says, I, even I, am he that comforteth you. Why should you be afraid of, of your oppressor? You know, why should you be afraid of man who can die? This comfort I would give is an eternal comfort. You know, many people... They are wishing for good things this year. Will they get it? I don't know. Maybe they will. But there will always be some disappointment. If our hope is placed on earthly things, there will always be something that will disappoint. But if our hope is in the everlasting God who gives spiritual blessings, and if we look to him for those things, we shall never be disappointed because our souls will be saved. Now we want to see next the person who brings this salvation. So who do you pray to? You know, friends who have come here to visit. Are you looking for prosperity this year? Money, wealth? Now you might be very happy with nice words, placating words. 
you know, oranges and ang baos and nice words that are showered on you. But if you truly understand what you need, which is salvation from your sins, you would not be looking to those things and nice words. You will be looking at the gospel that you are a sinner. And you will receive everlasting condemnation. But the good words, the prosperous words, the wonderful words is that Christ can save you from your sins. He can bring spring to your life. Every year in Christ shall be a prosperous spiritual year if you look to him. So who is the one who brings the salvation? Well, in verse 13, we see that there are two people mentioned. The first is the Lord. The second is the oppressor. If we remember the Lord, he's the maker of heaven and earth, why should we fear the oppressor? Verse 13 describes God as the maker of heaven and earth. If we believe on him, what is the fury of the oppressor? You know, even in the first deliverance, when God rescued his people from Egypt, he defeated the dragon, the Pharaoh. Now, there's another oppressor that is mentioned here in verse 13. Another dragon, if you will. Who is this oppressor? This is the devil. He is the ultimate dragon. He is the one who destroys the souls of mankind. He is the one who deceives us that what you really need is good fortune, material blessings, happiness now. And he blinds you to the fact that you need to think about your eternal soul. You know, the devil is the one who promises success, wealth, blessings, and pleasure. If only we listen to him. Did he not say to Christ, just take up these stones and turn them into bread. Fulfill your requirements now. You want to be successful? Worship me and I will give you the kingdoms of the world. And so those people who do not think about their e eternal fate are deceived by that dragon, by that oppressor. They only look at their earthly success. He tempts us to sin and he pro oppresses us because these blessings that he gives to us do not last for an eternity. And when he causes us to sin, our sin requires judgment from God. The Bible tells us the wages of sin is death, but the Lord is strong to save. And there are two words in this passage that speak of this salvation that God can give to anyone who calls upon him. These two words are the word ransom and redeem. God has paid a ransom to save the soul of anyone who calls on him for salvation. And that ransom is paid and those who believe and accept that payment are redeemed. They are saved. And as believers, we know that God is the one who sent the Lord Jesus into the world. He took on himself the sins of those who would believe on him. He gave his life as a payment. You know, Christ, as he came the first time, could have conquered his enemies with the sword, but that was not the way to purchase salvation. Instead, he put away that sword. The way he conquered was by humility, was by sacrifice, was by selflessness. He took upon himself the punishment that was due to sinners. He paid their ransom in order to redeem them from this judgment of God. And that is why, as the passage says, if we believe in the Lord God Almighty, why should we even fear the oppressor? Why should we even fear the devil? Because our sins have been forgiven. Friends, the Bible tells us 
that those who believe in Christ shall never die. Well, yes, there's physical death. It is for a time, but our souls shall live on forever. And that is true prosperity. What do you profit if you gain the whole world, but you lose your soul? So this year is a prosperous year. It's wonderful, and you receive all kinds of blessing, material success, but you lose your soul. What good is all the fortune that the devil can bring to you when you reject the blessing of the dragon slayer? You know, many people, they wish for good fortune. Every year, prosperity. Nian nian you yu. Good luck and monetary growth, right? What's that? Not sing nian kuai le, but gong si fa tai. We're all interested in tai, in money. But what we must be interested in are spiritual blessings. You know, during Chinese New Year, you have food to symbolize fortune and laughter. In my family, we have dried oysters and hairy lichen. Hao shi fa cai. We have prawns cooked with lettuce. Why? Sheng Tai for life. You eat the prawns and you will sue, ha ha, but your sins will cause sorrow for you for an eternity. What is the point of laughing for a season when your souls have not been forgiven? Your sins have not been forgiven. So there are people who may be very comfortable in this dragon year, but unless their sins are forgiven, unless they pray for the rule and salvation of God in their lives, they are still under the control of that ultimate dragon, of Satan himself. They are blinded to eternal salvation, only favoring prosperity now. So friends, what can you do to have ultimate deliverance and blessing? The Bible is very clear. Call on God to awake to save your soul. God, three times in this passage, tells you to listen. He will save you. He will bless you. He will deliver you. He will forgive you. But you must turn to Him. And therefore, this evening, I speak many good words to you. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent of your sins, and you will be saved. Pray to Him as your saving King, and He will rescue you. Dearly beloved, for all of us who have called on Christ, how is His rule evident in our lives? Mm. Do you want gong si fa tai this year? Fa tai? Fatai, fatai, you want to travel and be prosperous and seek after these comforts of life? Do you not want godliness? Do you not want the joy of salvation? What is it that you, dearly beloved, ought to be looking for? Shall we therefore not submit? to His rule and receive that grace over us that we would continue to pray that His kingdom come. And what a glorious time of prosperity and success and spiritual forgiveness and eternal joy that would be. May our hearts be truly converted. Let us pray together. Our eternal heavenly King, we praise you for the salvation that you have brought to those.
to whom you have given eternal wisdom to call upon you for eternal salvation. We thank you, O Lord, that from the foolishness of our hearts, which only yearn for earthly blessings, you have taught us the importance of the soul, what a person must give for his soul. And we thank you for the gospel, these good words that teach us to repent and believe, to trust in the rule of an everlasting saving king. So grant us, O oh Lord, the conviction this year to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we do pray for friends here who have heard the gospel again and again. We pray, Lord, that they will have no rest in their hearts till they answer that burning question of the state of their soul. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.